Welcome along, this is Alex again, giving you a quick run through of the pictures that have been across my desktop this week. Um, another week where I've managed to do both some photography and, and quite a lot of processing. So I've got plenty of, there's 35 pictures here to run through quickly. Um, those that have seen the previous episode in this series, um, one of the, the pictures in that was at the photo of the hawkfish. And so um, with an anthus in its mouth and I saw it and the interest in that picture made me process another one from the series and there's a few more I need to dig through but um, we'll start there but before that um, as a few people have been asking I'm going to try to leave the metadata up here on the right hand side of the screen so you can have a look at the metadata and below that I'll try and keep it so you see the camera details as well so on my um, recent Maldives trip I was shooting with the Nikon D5 and you can see that this picture was taken with a 105 millimeter lens it was shot on f10 at 1 to 50th of a second and and that sort of thing so you can have a look at that side of the imaging as well i'm not going to talk a lot about settings but it's there if anyone can read if anyone wants to read it you'll probably need to watch this video at full hd to be able to read those numbers off um, i would imagine because um, they're quite small on my screen and they'll be down it'll be down raised a bit for youtube won't it okay right so um the reason I wanted to start with this one is actually I was going to, from this one, scroll back in time. And sharing that picture online reminded me that I'd photographed a quite a similar photograph. Um, just to remind you, this is the um, the freckled hawkfish, which is eating an anthias. And actually in this picture here, this um, lemon coral goby, um, which are usually red, um, but in the Red Sea, we're very familiar with seeing them yellow, which is where they get their name from. Um, was very keen to steal this fish from the anthias and actually was running up and sort of trying to nip it and take it out of there. I didn't get a photo of that, but I did get a photo of the two of them right side by side. And you can see the two of them there. Anyway, this photo reminded me that years ago, um, many years ago, perhaps 20 years ago, I took a very similar picture, um, which is this picture here in the Red Sea. Um, and this picture here shows a another freckled hawkfish, but this time eating a baby freckled hawkfish. So I'd never processed this one before. It was shot on slide film. I used to show it as a slide, obviously, in talks, but it, I'd never actually added the scan slide to my photo library, so I thought I'd dig that out as well. It seemed a good reminder to dig that picture out. Obviously, that being a slide, you don't get any camera data on that one, for those looking at the metadata. And, just, and while I was digging that slide out, I also spotted this slide, which is from the Maldives in 1998. And although it doesn't seem a very interesting picture, in the Maldives in 1998 was when the first big mass coral bleaching took place, certainly in the Indian Ocean, that had ever been recorded. And I happened to be in the Maldives, kind of, I would say, in the run-up to the main bleaching event. Um, I left just before it all started. Um, but have a number of photos showing the corals getting very, very white as they bleach. And, and, and in the end, they went on to die and there was mass mortality across the Maldives at that time. And and there have been many more bleaching events since, which has really damaged the, the coral environment in that, in that place. But because this is such a momentous, um, not particularly pleasingly so, but such a, an important event in coral reef ecology, um, having got a photo of it, I thought I'd process one out. So this is just a big parietes there, um, with um, which has been obviously very heavily bleached. Again, shot on slide film, but I've processed it out so it can be added to the library. Right, um, the rest of the pictures here, they're mostly either from my recent Maldives shoot, um, which are additional to the ones that I'd processed in the first batch that we went through last time. Um, and also there's some which I've shot in the UK more recently, I think, which is what we're going to go through today. So I did some, I processed some more of these nighttime manta shots. Um, they're, they're very charismatic subjects and I have lots and lots of photos of them because they whizzed over our head for plenty of time. So I thought I'd just show a few of these. Um, this one here, just at one coming right at the camera. There's actually the faint traces of another in the background here, but not really enough to contribute that much to the image. This picture here, a, a long exposure with panning, capturing the movement of a manta as it swooped past the lens on the night dive. This one was taken on a much slower exposure of a quarter of a second with intentional camera movement to, to generate this strong panning effect. Um, I quite like this bigger scene. I think this could be quite a good magazine shot. Um, it's why I process this one. It's very, it'd be a very good sort of opening spread for a, an article on these. Um, you know, we sort of imagine big titles, a couple of blocks of text on it, and then you turn over the page and get greeted by some of these more in-your-face in images. So uh, that's why I thought I'd process that one out. 
um, this one here as well. Um, just cruising overhead, nice portrait. Right, they're all quite quite samey um, there. Ah, just on those who are checking the settings of these, um, you'll see a lot of them. These are shot with my Nikonos RS 13mm fisheye. That lens does not record the correct aperture. Um, so the apertures you're reading here are actually slightly above what I was using. F10 on that lens indicated is actually only F7.1. Um, um, however, that lens being a water contact lens, I'm able to shoot that lens on a much more open aperture and get excellent image quality than I could if I was using a dome port. That's a discussion for another day, but I think there is a big dome port video on this channel on YouTube, so you're very welcome to go and watch that and understand why I'm able to shoot that lens more open. Um, however, that camera doesn't um, record apertures. Um, that lens doesn't actually, actually record the correct aperture that it was used at. Um, so when you use it, you you need to sort of have that, that exchange rate in your head um, so that you can get the lens to the right settings. A couple more of the whale shark feeding at night at the surface. I like this one here with the water gushing in to its mouth as it sucks the water as it was beginning to go into kind of a botella feeling, feeding. And this one here is quite a funny one because the whale shark is actually the background here and the little fish in the, is, is, the, is, the, is what's in focus. This little sort of um, post larvae or probably larval still um, trigger fish or file fish just floating around in front of the whale shark here. Um, this is an accidental shot. I was shooting with the camera held in the water um, and this is just the autofocus happened to pick up on this guy. But I quite like the effect so I've, I've processed it out. Um, then a school of paddle tail snappers doing their usual being uncooperative, run, running up and down the reef. And some nice fusiliers. Um, I do think the Maldives reefs are sort of very typical, um, very celebrated for, in fact, their fishiness. And I love to, to get that fishiness into my shots. Um, particularly if I can combine fishiness and a little bit of the reef environment too. Um, these are the, the blue streak um, fusiliers, the ones that they come in two color types and the other color type are the ones that look like oversized neon tetras anyone who's familiar with those small freshwater fish um and then this is the other color type and then what else have we got from the maldives uh, just a couple of other shots um just this is an emwl one shot of an enemy fish hiding in and amongst an enemy it's not there was potential for better images here but the an enemy fish were actually quite timid and it's the emwl one they weren't that relaxed around so i do think i will get some amazing an enemy fish shots with that lens i just need more aggressive an enemy fish really and then i think i'll get amazing images with it um, but the pink of that an enemy was very nice um, and then this is a long exposure of a nurse shark um, at night the light in the background is a light on the surface it's a um a um it's a Electric, electric light on, on the jetty um, creating that background effect but it kind of looks like the sun or the moon or something like that which I think is quite interesting it's quite a nice long exposure blur effect on this shot which is why I like it I haven't really been through the pictures on this dive properly yet right and then the other images I was going to show you are all from this week in the water actually and I, I processed them relatively quickly because they were needed um, and I'll just run through those these are taken in the UK diving in a freshwater quarry called Cape and Ray, um, actually where my, my good friend Adam Hanlon um, works a lot of the time um, teaching diving, um, but Adam's away in Mexico, so although I got to go up to Cape and Ray where it's, it's his, his home homeland, um, I actually didn't get to see Adam because he's away, um, but he did thankfully arrange for us to have fantastic Mexican cenote level visibility there, and we were very lucky that we had really nice visibility, nice blue clean water and really good photographic opportunity. Um, my friend Caroline Robertson Brown um, very graciously decided to to leave her camera on land that day and, and come in and model for these shots, uh, which I'm really grateful for because it gave me the opportunity to get a huge amount out of two relatively short dives, actually. Um, I was on quite a tight schedule. I wanted to get home in time um, for dinner with the family. so but did manage to get a couple of dives in and we greeted with very nice conditions. Um, these are some of the shots we got. This is a, a plane, um, I think it's a Hawker plane. Um, it's written in the caption actually. Um, oh, I could do with moving that up anyway. So I'll tell you what type of plane it is anyway. Um, 
Oh, right, no, these, um, I copied these onto this disc before I wrote the captions. So um, they're not on there. Anyway, I'll slide that back up so you can see. These pictures here, I didn't use my D5. I went back to using my D850, uh, which I have to say every time, I, I prefer shooting the D5, but the files are much <laughs> nicer from the D850. Um, and I, I think I'm probably going to rest the D5 for most of the rest of this year and just keep using that D850. Um, so this is um, some shots of the plane. We did some horizontals and some verticals. I shared one of the horizontals online and then we went inside the the wreck and did some shots with the show to show the torch um here using the torch to light the roof of the wreck of the plane wreck and then a couple of shots of his caroline um swimming inside the wreck i did do some modeling in there um for her she was she did actually have her her little action camera um with her and i did do some modeling in return as well although i don't think i was quite as elegant in my modeling um, and I did some verticals as well. Um, one, you know, although I much prefer the horizontal pictures as a, you know, one thing you learn very quickly working as a photographer wanting to sell pictures is even if you feel the strongest composition of a scene is a horizontal. In this case here, I definitely felt that the horizontal was the much stronger composition. I made sure I, I nabbed a couple of vertical compositions as well um, when shooting just and, and processed one out just because um, those pictures have different uses um, for publications. Of course, there's enough resolution in a D850 file to crop it into a vertical and still use it massive. Um, but it's nice to, to have the horizontals there, shot as horizontal, um, so that should a magazine want to use them as a, as a full page or even a cover page, they're available for them. This is a, another shot inside a, inside a, a, a ship. Um, a wooden ship that's in the in the in the lake there and then we did a few shots just out in the blue the water was so nice and the sky was unusually sunny for that part of the world those of you who who know the north of england know that already those of you who know the reputation of england as being not the sunniest country will be aware of that and those that know that the, and, and even if you don't know the northwest of england is is probably one of the rainier parts so uh, a rainy country in a rainier part of the country, we were very pleased to have this lovely blue sky, lovely weather, and I definitely wanted to make the most of that photographically. So we actually ended up shallowing up and shallowing up to do these shots, um, just because the background was getting nicer and nicer. And I love this picture taken probably only at about two meters depth. Um, and just the cloud formation behind Caroline really made this picture. It's not the most interesting under the water, but it was so nice above the water, I, I processed this picture. Um, then a few of the guys from um, Mara's UK were there with us um, for the um, for the day. So I just took a couple of snapshots of them and they're processed here. This is Henny and this is Ed. Um, they just, I just took these pictures for them really. But um, having processed them, I thought I'd, I'd keep them. They might be useful at some point. And then we went in for a second dive. Um, I discovered that my diving cylinder um, was only at 90 bar. I discovered this in the car park before the dive. So we just agreed to do a shallow dive we still managed most of an hour i think on that second dive um with with that that cylinder um i don't know whether i dived it last year i presume i dived it last year and then put the the top back on it and just assumed it was full and i only checked the first cylinder at home because they both had caps on i just assumed i'd left them full over the winter um and that's really it was a bit of a rookie mistake i could have easily got it filled at the dive center there but in the end i found 90 bar was enough for us to do what we wanted to do photographically so we went in for a second bar a second dive make the most of the good conditions um, these are some shots of caroline when we first went in um, then the trout started to show an interest in us there's there's not as many trout as they used to be in cape and ray but they are much bigger than they were sort of when i last photographed them most of about 10 years ago and um, they are also really friendly they'll swim right up to your mask um, which is obviously ideal for photography um, you can do nice shots showing divers around the the trout um, and we even got the guys to, to line up a little bit. It was quite fun too, because the visibility was so good. It was a really nice opportunity to shoot more than one diver in a picture. In, in the early days of the British Society of Underwater Photographers, one of the goals of UK photography was to actually photograph a whole diver in UK conditions. And the reason this was a challenge is, first of all, UK conditions are really clear. And secondly, there weren't actually wide angle lenses at that time. So the challenge was for people to develop wide angle lenses and also to find that good visibility. And obviously, when you get a lucky day like I got here and you have a fisheye lens on, I had the ability not just to do single diver shots in the UK, but actually to do two diver shots and actually shoot these big scenes, which, you know, 
364 days of the year you'd really struggle to ever get this type of shot in uk waters so it was really nice to have the chance to to really sort of go for these big scenes with multiple elements in them um so here we've got you know three divers and two fish um which i i think is a really cool type of shot to do in uk waters and this one's with one of the the sturgeon that's in the water there um these are you know um, people keep them in their ponds and then when they've got too big they've been released into the into the lake there um but yeah i was really happy to give the chance to do pictures like this i was really happy that the guys were all diving in although they're obviously wearing mara's branded gear here they're all diving in different gear um Ed's kind of got all the tech gear on. Caroline's got kind of, you know, good, like, top-end recreational gear. And um, Henny's kind of got he's got his semi-dry on because he'd lent me his dry suit, to be fair. And um, I kind of, kind of quite like that the three of them are all dressed differently. Um, more interesting than them all wearing the same sorts of clothes. Right, I think that is the set. Yeah, we're back to those. So hopefully you found that interesting. And I'll, um, I'll keep doing these whenever I've had a week where I've processed pictures.